normally, 75% of us sitting here in this room is going to walk here, out of here, unchanged. That's the scary statistic, huh? 75%. That means only 25% of us sitting here would take the word to heart, allow the Holy Spirit to take us a step further beyond the Sunday experience and allow that seed to grow. Some of us will have a great experience today and, and some would just, the word would just go over it. So uh, what I want us to do is bring that before the Lord. I don't know about you, but I'm saying, God, let me be part of that 25% at least. Or just increase it for this day. Or, or let my heart, if God can't increase it, actually let me just correct myself there. It's us bringing our hearts before the Lord. Would you want to, uh, do you want to bow your heads just where you are? And we just bring that to the Lord, our hearts. And say, Lord Jesus, where we are, we bring our hearts to you this morning, Father. And Father, I pray for every seed that was that's about to be sown, Lord. I pray that our hearts be ready, Lord, to receive, Lord. We'll be ready to go. We're we'll ready to respond, Lord. We'll be ready and honest with you, Father, just to, to answer you honestly, Lord, where we are. But Father, we thank you this morning that you do not leave us here, that we're on a journey with you, Lord, and that you take us, Father, to a place where you want us to grow, to expand, and to experience more of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'm excited, like I said earlier on in the... My, my little one stood at the back there. I don't know if they're going to play the clip. The clip was supposed to be for Facebook, but uh, no, they played in church. But anyway, and she walked in here and she said, but why is Daddy there? It doesn't make sense. Because <laughs> he's there as well. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, but uh, I'm excited to, to, to share with you um, the new series. And specifically this morning, we're going to share on the power of one um, next week. Rainer and Ruan probably share on the power of two. Um, so we're building upon that. The week after that, Pastor Carl will be sharing on the power of the unknown, and I'll be sharing again the last one on the power of how. Okay, so they're all components of healthy prayer and to, in, to help us to get back, to get that into our lives as a, as a discipline. And there's only one of them that we're going to share on. There are so many other disciplines and aspects of our relationship with God, and may the Holy Spirit guide you that he would even go beyond prayer this morning uh, in interpreting. And in this specific part that we're dealing with this morning in Scripture, is actually, and I always say that I, like old, I love Old Testament, so many stories. And stories tells me or teach me so many lessons. This time it's about a king that lived in, there was a king of Judah. He was the, one of the good kings. Um, and we all know that he had so many kings the bad and the good and the bad and the ugly and the good and the ugly and the bad. And, you know, it's almost like that. I don't know. Um, judges are full of those examples. Kings, the chapters, second kings, third kings, oh, not third kings, uh, kings and chronicles, they are full, full of that. And are filled with stories of good kings and bad kings. And then the good king would rise just after the bad king. And, and so, and you always read those stories and I always, I was always thought, you know, when are you going to learn the lesson? Didn't somebody told you before, you know, they told you that you were, that this and this will happen as a result of the bad decisions that you're making. But unfortunately, um, we blame them, but we make the same mistakes as well in life. We, we refuse to see and to learn from the ones that sometimes has gone before us. And uh, we sometimes, it's just pride there eh, that we try to follow our own way and then we pay our own school fees. Why do you want to pay the school fees if somebody else already paid the school fees? Learn from them. And if somebody older say to you, don't go down this way, trust that that person has been down this way and, 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 and uh, that we can learn from them. You know. But in this case, it was a good king. He lived in Israel and uh, he, he reigned from 721 to 686 BC. That was quite a lot of years before Christ came. But um, he reigned in Judah, sorry, not Israel. For about 29 years, okay, 29 years, he reigned there from the age of 25 till about the age of 54, when he died. So he died quite young. Um, he removed the sacred pillars. The Bible actually commends him for his com uh, his commitment to God, his devotion towards God, and it was a good man. He removed sacred pillars. He actually removed the bronze serpent. Interesting story there, that the actual thing that. God used as a method or just symbolic became actually a method of worshipping that uh, bronze serpent. And he had to remove that. 
He refused to pay tribute to the king of Assyria. He defeated the Philistines, all of those kind of things. And he was recorded as a, as a good man that served the Lord faithfully. Until one day when two specific things happened. And you know, there's a but in the story, so you have to pay attention when there's a but. <laughs> Normal man of God, devoted to God, faithfully serving the Lord. And then two things happened that would cause a little bit of a change of history, a change of a story that the story is diverted. Now, if you watch all these soapies and what? Can you see a piece? What is it? Soapies? No. Is it soapies? Yeah. They always have a kunkel in the kabel, <laughs> you know. But anyway, this is also one of the stories that things started changing because of two specific incidents, or s not incidents, but um, actually some bad news that he got. The bad news that this king Hezekiah received actually didn't just change history and didn't just change the normal scope of life and how things went. It actually changed his prayers. He changed his prayers, the way he was praying. Now, on Tuesday morning, when we were praying in the back there in the coffee lounge, I think the thing that is always rewarding to me is hearing God's voice. Apart from the worship, apart from the sermon, apart from everything else, it's just to hear his voice in the middle of the crowd, in the middle of somebody speaking. Yesterday, when I was having a conversation with somebody, sometimes just so... Beautiful, you would hear God's voice behind that person. And then I'm like, I wish I could just stop the conversation now and just go and write that down now, but we're in the conversation here. But anyway, so on Tuesday morning, there was a moment while we were praying that the Lord asked me, said this to me, he said, Jaku, I want you to ask the people this. Now, can we just, I want to say that up front. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm not trying to manipulate you. I'm not trying to sow any fear. But the Lord asked me this. He said, Yako, ask the people, when are you going to get serious with me? Or when? What needs to change in your life or happen in your life before you're going to become serious? Sometimes we need to, hand, to be handed a little bit of bad news. <laughs> hmm? Although we don't like it. I am... Um, I said to the, first, to the first service, to the people in the first service, I've got a habit every now and then when I go back to the south where I grew up and I, I know the people there. I grew up there. I literally know the people that was older than me that went before me. So I've got that habit of going to the cemetery just to realign myself, just to remind myself. I walk through that cemetery I read the names of the people. I think yes, this guy lived here. I forgot about him. And uh, we all just like vapor. Huh? We forget like, like that about people that lived in this earth. Sometimes we have to remind ourselves, go there. But in, in, in one way, it helps me to remind myself of where I'm going or through the door that I'm going. We're not going to stay there. We're all going to go through that door. And it reminds me that I have to reassess and realign and just check myself. Am I still in, in the right direction? Am I still spending my time wisely, God? Um, I don't know how much time I've got left, but God, one thing I know is I have to, if you're not coming before then, I've got to go through that door. <laughs> and we all live as we want to live 150 years. And, and I jokingly said, and you probably heard it as well, we all want to go to heaven, just nobody wants to die. So... Um, <laughs> I don't know, if I ask you this morning, you want to go to heaven? I don't know, everybody will probably raise their hand. So if I ask you, are you ready to go? Let's go now. <laughs> you say, wait a minute, Lord, I'm not yet finished. There's a couple of things that still need to be done. So I hope you're figuring out what you need to do still <laughs> before you go. Pack your suitcase and go in the, in the wood coffin. We're not talking about the death this morning. I'm just saying we need to value life and we need to value the time that we have got here on earth. And anyway, so I was asked, or oh, the Lord was asking me this question, Yaku, um, what needs to change in your life? Or what needs to change in the circumstances around your life for you to become more serious about me? Same with this king, Hezekiah. And while I was meditating upon that, and I didn't have this specific scripture in mind yet, I started meditating and the Lord said, go to and read the story of Hezekiah again. So I started reading the story and I'm I realized the bad news that he got, the two incidents of the two bad scenarios that he found himself with. And how that changed the course of history, meditating upon that the whole Tuesday. If you've got your Bibles, let's read from Second Kings this morning. Second Kings 18. 
And we'll also be reading from 2 Kings 20. You can, uh, we can't read the whole two chapters, or three chapters, so you can read that at home. I'll just cover a few verses there, just to give us some background and reference for where we're going this morning. 2 Kings 18, verse 13 to 18. 2 Kings 20, verse 1 to 2. From verse 13, in the 14th year of King Hezekiah's reign, King Sennacherib of Assyria came to attack the fortified towns of Judah and conquered them. King Hezekiah sent this message to the king of Assyria at Lachish. I have done wrong. I will pay whatever tribute money you demand if you will only withdraw. The king of Assyria then demanded the settlement of more than 11 tons of silver and one ton of gold. To gather this amount, King Hezekiah used all the silver stored in the temple of the Lord in the palace treasury. Hezekiah even stripped the gold from the doors of the Lord's temple and from the doorpost he had overlaid with gold, and he gave it all to the Assyrian king. Nevertheless, the king of Assyria sent his commanders-in-chief, his field commander, and his chief of staff from Lachish with a huge army to confront King Hezekiah in Jerusalem. The Assyrian took... The Syrians took up the position beside, beside the aqueduct that feeds water into the upper pool near the road leading to the field where clove where clove is washed. They summoned King Hezekiah, but the king sent these officials to meet with him. Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, the palace administrator, Shebna, the court secretary, and Joa, son of Asaph, the royal historian. And let's page or turn over to page. The following page in my Bible, chapter 20, from verse 1. About that time, and I remember that was the first bad news, the first uh, headline that he received. First SMS, the first WhatsApp, the first phone call that he got, the bad phone call that he got. Now he got another one. About that time, in that same time, Hezekiah became deathly ill, and the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to visit him. He gave the king this message. This is what the Lord says. Set your affairs in order, for you are going to die. You will not recover from this illness. When Hezekiah heard this, he turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Okay, let's just stop there. I don't think it's nice news to get from somebody. I don't know about you. Somebody get, uh, you receive a, pro- uh, receive a prophet and he tells you, listen, um, I've got good news for you. This is even before you know you're sick, probably. That you're going to die. You are going to die. And like this uh, pastor just said, um, the deaf has got an amazing ability just to rearrange our priorities. I was talking to Van earlier this week as well, that we sometimes so easily lose track of the bigger picture. But when you are around somebody that's fighting for life, then you realize, you know, we really have to check our priorities. And um, I couldn't help to meditate upon the scripture, ask myself, why do we not pray fervently? I mean, it's not that we do not pray, but it's just sometimes that when certain things happen, our prayers change. Do you agree agree with me that sometimes certain things happen and we pray a little bit more fervently? We pray, we do our normal prayers, you know, you wake up, you thank you, Lord, and you're good. And we even pray that same mechanical type of prayer at at dinner as well and lunch. People start, your children start copying you, you realize now you've been going into default mode, you know praying the same thing. You don't even think about that. It's you're reciting certain words. Jesus is actually referring to that in, a, in another situation with the Pharisees, vain repetitions. He's saying, do not bring me vain repetitions. Because there's, there's, an, there's an danger for us here. As child of God, listen to me, as child of God, there's a danger that we can go into default mode. That we do this too much, that we go in default mode. That we know all the, okay, you must do it now, You must say Amen. You must say Hallelujah. We pray it this way. You just hang around this crowd long enough. You're standing or you're at a place where you can go over into default mode. There's a danger. There's a real danger that we can start praying mechanical type of prayers where we just go through the motions, come through another Sunday, just sit here, great Sunday, go, we go home, same thing. And then before long, we're not in love with God anymore. We just, we enjoy this. We don't deny God. But somewhere we're just drifting. And I had to ask myself the question, Lord, why is it that sometimes we don't pray that fervently or seriously? Because it shows in our stats, and I'll come back to that. If I look at the scripture here, 
And I believe God wants to say something to us here. There are two reasons why we find our strength, or why we do not pray that serious or that fervently. And first of all, we find our strength elsewhere. If you would know that the only reason to your survival is prayer, you'll spend time there. But often, we've got interest at other places as well. I find my strength in other stuff. That's why I don't pray. King Ezekiah was faced with the bad news. The king and the army surrounding his town. They were literally surrounding him. They cut off the water supply. Jokingly said to Norbert, and that is a, he had a situation like that almost. When you've got no water. Imagine that for a moment. People coming in from other side of the town and we heard about the enemy maybe from the sea. They surround Swakut Munt. Nobody can go out. And initially we're okay. Now oh, I've got food. Then they cut off the water supply. You can't buy food. Things start changing. Now they've got the enemy around them. And then the Bible says, look at this, the enemy demanded him to compromise, asked him some gold, 11 tons of silver and I think one ton of gold. He didn't have enough. And then he did something I believed totally wrong. He compromised by taking the silver and gold of the temple. It takes a man of faith, you hear me this morning, when the enemy is knocking at your door, threatening to take, it takes a man of faith not to touch that which is sacred in our finances. That's the quickest place we run to. <laughs> Let me just take, oh, Lord, I'll give you this. Right? You just have to be satisfied now. Okay? I could, I'll take from this. And, and you know what the amazing thing is if you read that story with the enemy? Where, was he satisfied? Did that please him? No. He didn't please him. He was still there. He paid him all that money that he stripped from the for silver and gold from the temple that he wasn't supposed to take. He gave it to the king, or to, the, to the enemy, and the enemy was still there. And the lesson, I believe, what God is saying to us, you know, we sometimes run to that and we hope that that is going to sort the problem. That's not going to sort the problem. You start touching which belongs to God. That's God's. If we want to trust God that He needs to take us out, don't touch that which you ask us to give. But it's not about tithing. I'm talking about giving to God. It's just interesting. I just discovered it. I never looked at it like that way. It's just when you do the exegesis, you just realize, oh, wow, I never saw it like that. But the fact of the matter is, silver and gold is representing the materialistic view that we've got in life sometimes. If I only have, if I only work a little bit harder and I can earn a, a little bit more and I drive in this car and I live in this house, then all will be well. And then I'll be okay, and I can sit back and I work a little bit harder, and then, and then I'm okay. And you know, sometimes that's just such a false form of security. That if I can live there, if I can work hard enough, if I can do that, then hey, man, I, I'll be okay. I've got this one covered, Lord, because I've got my strength there and I found my comfort and my security there. The other thing where we sometimes find our strength, not just in the materialistic part, it's in people. You read the story about the commander that came to Ezekiah. He refers to Egypt. And Egypt speaks to us this morning about man. It's rather so much easier to run to man when you're facing certain challenges than running to God sometimes. Because we become more comfortable in each other's presence. It's easier almost in a way to run to my wife or wife to a husband and we're there for one another. We have brothers and sisters there to support one another. But listen to me. No man on this earth can take that place that God wants you to have. I cannot be God to you. Nor can any person in this church be God to you. You need to have that special place reserved for Him. Not even your husband, not even your wife, not even your child, as much as you love them, as much as they are called there to stand side by side, to pray for you, to support you. But we cannot become more familiar with the voice of man than the voice of God in our lives. Because God will set you up for failure. He will set you up to a place where no man can help you. Where you'll have no other ultimate than to run to Him. And say, God, now nobody can help me. I've always been running 
to somebody else. I listened to somebody the other day that said something very remarkable, very interesting. He said this. He said, if somebody, if somebody is becoming the source of God's voice in your life, that is wrong. That person needs to be the encourager of God's voice in your life. How often we tie ourselves with, to, to people. You know, we like this. We find, uh, and God has given us as a gift to one another. But we never called to tie ourselves to one another in that sense. You know, we called to stand here, even through the trials and tribulations. But we cannot allow that man takes the place of God in our lives. God will set us up. He will set us up. He will allow Egypt to fail so that we will have to run back to him and say, you know what, I cannot run to man anymore. God has got the one. And I really believe that we sometimes put our trust in other things, in man, in materialistic stuff, and we feel comfortable. But for us this morning, prayer is a sign, I believe, of humility. It's a place where we just humble ourselves. When we bow our knees... And say, Lord Jesus, here I am. It's a sign of humility. It's a sign of God, I need you. Of God, I, I haven't got everything under control. God, I, I don't know about that. God, I don't know about that. But the moment we refuse or our prayer life becomes vague and not filled with purpose, it's a sign that we're drifting away. The picture I saw is like a boat on a river. We all know if you go fishing or you go on the boat, and if the engine turns off or you don't use the, what's the respawn? Huh? Niemand weet hier. Respawn. What? Or. Okay, teach me something here. This morning. Anyway. But if you just sit there, and I'm talking to Christians here this morning. Hey, listen to me. I'm talking to people believing that they're okay. That I've accepted Jesus Christ. If you just sit there, guess what? The stream will eventually take you in the direction. Life is like that. We continuously need to make a decision daily. I'm going to follow Christ. I'm going to go against the stream. Because the stream of this world will take you in a specific direction. And that's why I'm against people sitting. And sitting in church. And sitting there. And just waiting for another person just to start their boat. And can I jump on your boat? No, you need to get your own boat and work out your own salvation, when Paul said. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's just single boats there when we get to Jesus. When one church, but you all got to a single boat. <laughs> we get there, hopefully. We need to make a decision daily. But I'm getting distracted, sorry. <laughs> Where was I? Oh, yeah. When we pray, it's a sign of humility. It's a sign that we say to God, I'm not okay. I haven't got this one covered. I want you. I, I, I'm involving you in my life, admitting that I need you. On Wednesday night, if you decide that you're going to go to a cell group, you'll be one of 35% of people, and I'm talking about attendance, I'm not talking about people on paper, that's a different thing, an average, that regularly cut out time during a week to say, Lord Jesus, I need to take my relationship further than just to be on the Sunday experience. The rest say they don't have time. On Tuesday morning or on Wednesday, if you decide, you know, Lord, I want to pray for this congregation, you'll be less than 10% of this congregation, part of the less of 10% of this congregation doing that. The reason why I'm saying that is, as I was meditating upon that week, and I was, uh, this week, I was just thanking God that there are people that are willing to pray for others. And I want you to, I'm saying that slowly, and carefully so that it can sink in. Thank God that there are people this past week that prayed for you. That took out time. That said, Lord, this is not, this is not too much of an effort. Because I love my brothers and sisters. I love this church. I love these people too much. I have to set, set time aside and pray for them. And maybe you do that at home as well. But there's something about coming together. There's something about what I've received this past week and Tuesday morning. Hearing God's voice, which I would have not received, I believe, it was just back there at home. I honestly believe every time when we come together, whether it's in the context of prayer, whether it's in the context of this, context of a cell group, I see that in Ephesians, that there's a certain amount of God's presence and revelation that's re left for that. For those that want to watch TV, that they don't get it. <laughs> that God humbles us to that place. But here's the thing. God wants to bring us to that place, to face that. 
to make that decision and say, Lord, this is, this is important. This is priority to me. The other thing I see in Ezekiah's life this morning about why we're not praying is that Ezekiah received the death notice, huh? death sentence, or the bad news. Now, I don't know about you. Maybe somebody has asked you, me, me personally, many times before. People say to you, oh, please pray for me. And uh, sometimes you get these requests from people you don't even really know. You know, just pray. And the real danger is there that that person is so far removed from me, I don't even pray. <laughs> Let's be honest. I probably think about that person. Oh, Lord, yeah, just bless and just but here's the thing, when that person becomes closer, when that news is a little bit closer to you, my attitude towards my prayer changed suddenly. The other night, on the Friday night, I get this call from Anilura and I heard that her voice, that she's not well, that she's worried. <laughs> and she shared the news about Daryl and they had to run to the hospital. When you get a phone call like that, you don't just sit back there and think, okay, now life is okay. Bless them, Lord, and carry on. When you love people, when it's a little bit closer to home, you get news like that. It does change your prayers. Maybe, just maybe, the bad news sometimes are just too far away from us. Maybe we're just not that much related. <coughs> And as much as it applies to the natural, it applies to us in the spiritual this morning as well. How about my neighbor across the street there? If he knows Jesus, I don't know, maybe I know and I can see in his lifestyle from what I see, from the fruit I perceive, I perceive and observe that it doesn't look good. The chances are good. It's not for me to judge, but based upon what I see, based upon the fruit that I see, because that's what we can judge, that he might probably go to hell. Does it bother me? How much time do I spend in prayer bringing that before God? The Bible said that Hezekiah, the moment he touched his body, when he touched him, he touched him, he wept before the Lord. And I couldn't help but wonder how many of us have lately wept before the Lord for the lost, for his children. The closer I get to him, the more I fall in love with his people. We cannot sit in this place this morning and you tell me that you are in love with God, but you don't have a compassion and a passion and a zeal and an unction to share the gospel or to get it out there for somebody that's totally lost. We are just deceived. We sit here this morning having great moments, great songs, great prayers, telling ourselves that we're okay, telling ourselves that we grow closer to God but we don't grow closer to His people. It's just so far removed from us. There's hope this morning. Amen. Say amen with me. There's hope huh, for us. Let's turn, let's turn the tide and let's see what Ezekiah is teaching us this morning if one man can pray. Basically, what we just saw is that, you know, why do we not pray? We find our trust elsewhere and the problem or the problem or the issue is just not so close to me. That's just the truth. Other day when we got the news about Yaku, same thing. People that we love, people that we walk with, people that we spend time with, our hearts get connected. We get to know one another. I tell you what, there are many more such people in this church. When you get that news, you love that people so much that you bring that before the Lord because I love that person. I don't want to see that the enemy steals there. So I'll stand in faith for God because I love that people. And it's a great sign this morning of how much we love God's people, how much and to what, de to what depth we're allowing God to take us in that. If that is an... If we are just listening, hearing that news, and we couldn't care less, it's just showing us that we're not in love with God this morning. But the story of Hezekiah teaches us, us, or teaches us this morning, that if one man, listen, if one man can earnestly pray and see God in prayer, three things can happen, which I see in his story. 2 Kings 19, turn with me to that chapter, 2 Kings 19. I'll just quickly read that for reference. Verse 14, it says, After Hezekiah received a letter from the messengers and read it, he went up to the Lord's temple and spread it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed this prayer before the Lord, O Lord, God of Israel, you are enthroned between the mighty 
cherubim. You alone are God of all the kingdoms of the earth. You alone created the heavens and the earth. Bend down, O Lord, and listen. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Listen to Sennacherib, Sennacherib's words of defiance against the living God. Man, what a kind of prayer. Uh, almost fighting with God. God, listen. Open up your eyes. See this. And then look at verse 34 that he's saying, and God's answering. He says, For my own honor and for the sake of my servant David, I will defend the city and protect it. And now you need to pay attention. The story is getting, uh, this is the highlight of the story. I love this. And if you were, as a young man, when I heard this, it was so, wow. That night the angel of the Lord went out to the Syrian camp and killed Hey, look at your Bibles. 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. When the surviving Assyrians woke up the next morning, they found corpses everywhere. That's the kind of God I serve. That you go to bed, that Ezekiah would go to bed, pray, earnestly seeking God, go to bed, and at night when he goes to bed, God goes to work. Uh, huh? He wakes up. Imagine that. Oh, having your first coffee, you look across uh, over the walls, and you see 185,000 people dead. You need to write it down. You need to maybe buy yourself something that's got 185,000 other stones. Pack it out somewhere so that it can just sink in. A lot of us have never seen 185,000 people being killed in one night. <laughs> Not me, <laughs> at least. Or 185,000 people in front of you. That miracle that took place was such an astounding miracle because one man humbled himself, seek God earnestly in prayer, and bang, God intervened. I don't know about you, but that makes me excited just to pray, just to say, God, it's not impossible. You can do so much. Nothing is impossible for you this morning. When I fall, when I go to bed, when I cannot do any more, Lord, you go to work. And that's the kind of God we serve this morning. If we can just humble ourselves, if we can just get ourselves to that, we'll realize there's so much things that God can do. Imagine if this church, imagine if more of us can get ourselves to pray what will happen to this town. That God will have to hear, will have to answer their prayers. If we see God earnestly, I'm not talking about, oh God, just save them. That when we cry out before God, when our hearts, when we bring our hearts before God and say, God, my heart is for the lost God. Start, smite my heart, work in my heart, change that. If it's not that, God, I'm bringing that before you. Uh, I, I tell you what, we cannot fool God. We cannot fool God. You can sit here this morning and tell me your heart is for the lost. You can't fool God. God will know that. We, we know. Here's, listen to the thing. If we sit here long enough, long enough, we know what to say. We say that from the head. We say, oh, my heart is for the lost, but in our heart, our actions and our fruit follows from the heart. That's what the Bible says. And I'm bringing myself before the Lord again. There are people sitting here this morning, and you're not in love with God anymore. And it shows in your fruit. You're still with God. You're still coming to the same old things. You're still doing the same old things. You're in the rituals, doing all of that, but you're just not in love with him anymore. <sighs> Hezekiah. Sorry, let me say this before I... You see, the enemy, the enemy handed him a letter. Go read that chapter further, the rest of that. The enemy handed him a letter and said, listen, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to do to you what... I want to do and all of that, you know, it's a really bad thing. He was trying to sow fear into that camp and um, try to speak in a different language so that they can uh, bring the vision in the camp. Interesting there, but I'm not going to go there. But here's the thing. The Bible said that Ezekiah, after he received the letter, he spread it out before the Lord. Some of you are sitting with the enemy's letter in your hand. You read it. You believed it. And now you start living according to that as well. Because, yeah, I'm just going to die. This is not going to be possible. This is the, uh, it's not going to be. That person across the street, he will never change. That person in my cell group, he will never change. My cell group, he will never grow. Because the enemy handed you a letter and told you, oh, it's not possible. But I love what this guy did. Say, God, I'll bring you this letter. Just check this if this is true. I don't know. I know you, Lord. But this almost a nonsense that this guy is talking about. Can I just give it to you? And you know, when, when you touch the people of, of, of people of God, you're touching God. That's what happened. God, they're coming against us. We are your people. I've been serving you. God, I'll be with you all the time. 
and God got to work at night because one man spread the letter before God. I'm asking you, maybe it's time that you take that letter to God. The letter of that person across the street, of the enemy that's telling you, never, don't go there, you'll never be able, your boss, whatever message you've received from the enemy. Not only this morning did we see amazing God that's coming through, or the amazing miracles that's taking place when one, man is take, uh, when one man is praying. But apart from that, I believe there's something else that we can learn this morning from Hezekiah's life. You so, see, when Hezekiah got the bad news, up to that time, I believe, he experienced a certain part of God up to that stage, who God is. And now God allows him to be set up for an increase of revelation. Hezekiah, I believe, in two places, two attributes of God. He's never seen God in that way before, until those moments, until those moments of bad news. The first one, deliverer. Second one, healer. You can sit here this morning. You can tell me, I know God is healer. But if you haven't faced him... You haven't been in a situation where it's touching almost your body, where it's touching somebody that you love, that you are close, but you have got a closer relationship. You would not know him as healer. Sometimes God allows us or the odds to come against us so that our revelation our expa- can be expanded, so that we can pray and pray and see God and God can come through and we're never the same again. Amen. He wants to stretch our faith. He wants to stretch your faith. It's exciting, but it's not always <laughs> lacquer, huh? It's not always going, going through that or being set up. It's not, we, God, get me out of this. Get me out. Get me out. And I remember Pastor Peter Petorius a couple of years ago, in, 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 they involved in jam ministries all across Africa, feeding children daily. They, their vision, I've told you before as well, that they were feeding back then almost a million children in Africa a day with the... Um, food, one meal a day. But anyway, he, he was sharing that they were in a, somewhere up in Africa, praying for in a, a specific conference, praying for children and people. And people were coming forward for healing and all of that. And he said this, you know, it's something when you start praying for people, for all kinds of things. And I don't know about you, but when you pray for somebody for sight, it's okay if you, this person is blind and he's got eyes. But it's a different thing. Listen to me. It's a different thing when that person hasn't got any eyes. And a little girl came and stand in front of him, no balls, eyeballs in the sockets. And the Lord challenged him to pray for sight for that girl. Now, I don't know what you I would run God, I don't know what to say, Lord. And he said he started praying for that young girl. And then as he was standing there, the eyeballs literally grew in front of him. And he said, There's one thing, when something like that happens, it takes your faith to a complete new level. You never see God the same after that. Maybe it's time that God sets us up so that our this thing can be stretched. That we look at God differently. We realize this is the kind of God we serve. God will not let us down. He will not set us up to let us down. You see, when the storm is over, what do we do? It's okay if we get the death notice, but do we just continue like life is normal? Or is our life will change completely? Because bad things happen to good people. Good people sometimes get bad news. And then we bring it to God, and God comes through, and then life goes on. The other day, we had a family. They're not with us. We visit occasionally. But they're not here, members. And, and they had a bad situation of extended family or family in, family in their family that had a difficult situation that happened. I can't share the detail to protect their identity, but the fact is they had a tough situation where something bad happened and it affected them as well, almost in sickness and death. Anyway, and they were here totally vulnerable, crying before God, broken. One of our leaders even went to pray with them during the service, and I thought, God, here's yes, a God moment. Even the the bad news that happens. God, you, you can redeem. Do you know how long that, that conviction lasted? One week. Back to normal. 
help us. Lord, help us that we not become so insensitive. What must God do to really get our attention? I'm not trying to so fear you. Sometimes we're just so out there, so in our own ways, own world, own direction, that we don't even see the stop signs, we don't see any form of God trying to communicate with us. So can I get your attention? Just take your eyes off this world and get it onto my world, onto my page, onto my agenda, where I want you to be. 2 Kings 19, verse 19, we see that in this story, in verse 19, that after Ezekiah received the bad news about his, um, his death, and God healed him miraculously after he prayed, that the king of Babylon came to visit Ezekiah. He said, listen, I heard about, I heard about your, um, that you were sick and that you, I heard that you were supposed to die and you're alive now. Can I just see you? And, and the message I'm trying, or I believe God is trying to say to us here is that when we pray, when we see God, and God comes through, our prayers and the answers to our prayers become testimonies to the world out there. That people out there that's not serving God, that's probably denying God, they don't have a chance to, or they cannot deny that there's a living God. Maybe it's time that we pray more fervently. So that God can get at work, get to work. And the world will see that our God is alive. Amen. I'll end with a story of a guy called Evan Roberts. Evan Roberts was a young guy from Wales, Wales guy, born in Wales in 1878. 1878, sorry. Born into a family, Christian family, into a house where they served the Lord faithfully, wholeheartedly. And as a result of that, he formed a strong character. Evan started memorizing scripture. And uh, as he was memorizing scripture, he started meditating upon that. And, um, and the Lord started moving in his life, and he started loving the Lord. He started spending time with the Lord more and more. And it's often been told that even at night when, when the family would call him to dinner, he would miss dinner time because he's just in the presence of God. And at the age of 13 years old, Evan had his first encounter with God. And that became one of his famous sayings when he said, Lord, what can I do for you? Lord Jesus, what can I do for you? How beautiful is that, eh? Jesus, you've done so much for me. Do you know, a lot of people don't even ask that question. Or they don't bother getting to that place of, Lord, what can I do for you? But anyway, Evan continued following and he served Lord, and, and some became, some started calling him the lunatic, the spiritual lunatic, because he was just so out, in, out there. When other young kids started dating and becoming interested in all those kind of things, Evan was in the Word. Evan was pursuing God, growing in his relationship, especially with the Holy Spirit, an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit, interceding, crying out for whales, seeking God. And one night in a service, he had these specific words. He said, I have reached out my hand and touched the flame. I'm burning and waiting for a sign. Beautiful. At 20 years old, when he was serving, and he was at church, and he started preaching and started going deep and deeper, the revival started breaking out. And I want to say this for all of us here this morning. Before revival comes into this place, into this town, into this nation, it must come in our hearts first. We cannot hope that revival will come out there and God will do a miracle and touch our president and touch the people out there if we are not in love. Because basically, pay attention, basically revival is just, God, stir up my love for you again. When all of us in this room, it's the alarm, eh? <laughs> when all of us in this room fall in love with Jesus once again, the whole church, then the revival breaks out. But the sadness, sad thing is some are in love, some are not. But that's survival. When we fall in love with Jesus again, nothing is too much. We do have time for things. That's priority. But the story goes on. And, and anyway, so what happened is survival broke out. And, and one night, Evan saw a, 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 mess, a, a, a vision of a hand that's stretching out from the moon to Wales. And God started moving among the people of Wales. And Evan was preaching for 100,000 people, or was praying, sorry, was praying for 100,000 souls to be saved in Wales. And God started moving in Wales. 
mightily. Amazing thing is that, that theaters had to close down. Political meetings had to be cancelled. Soccer players were not at the stadium. There were no fans at the stadiums. Bars, movie houses had to close down because there were no interest in that. They say that the local Bibles or the shops ran out of Bibles because people ran just to get a Bible. Nowadays, we just struggle to get people to bring their Bible to church. So I'm not saying that. Just because people, they treasure God's Word. I think sometimes we have to lose a little bit to realize what we have. But anyway, it carried on and on, an amazing work of God. But the, which I found interesting thing that happened is when they was working in those coal mines amongst those people, um, God started touching those mine workers. And it's almost like a lot of uh, matruesa. You know, they swear a lot. And what happened is what history tells us, that those horses that they were using for the carts to drive, take that out, those horses only responded to, to swear words, to curse words and all words of profanity. And when the people got saved and the men got saved in the mines and they stopped talking like that, <laughs> they had to retrain the horses because the horses couldn't respond to the previous or to the new commands. Amazing what God can do, huh? Overnight. <laughs> I just find it funny in a way. That's the kind of God we serve. But the Wales, or the Wales revival was found upon these four points. Listen, it was upon this thing. Confess all known sin. And if I can say something here, that's where we're always going to start. If we want to go ahead, we need to get to that place of repentance first. Jesus, I'm sorry. Jesus, I've missed you. Jesus, I don't want to go there. If we're too good to repent, to stop for a moment, to realize I've got, I've got it wrong, I'm in the wrong direction, we're not going to make it. It was found upon the fact that we search out all secret and doubtful things. Thirdly, confess the Lord Jesus openly. I said it in the first service as well. Confess the Lord Jesus openly. I've got a problem on a Sunday morning when the Holy Spirit moves, when there's an invitation for you to respond to the Holy Spirit and we move in secret. We do not want to be seen by people. We are so shy. We are so afraid that somebody's going to see I raise my hand or make a decision for Christ to say, here I am. That something in this place, in this house, in every church, in this town, in this nation, that if we cannot feel safe in this environment to raise our hands and to say, Jesus is my Lord, you'll have a problem out there, my friend. This is supposed to be your practice ground, your safe ground, that nobody would look at you strangely and think, you know, your weirdo, where are you coming from? That saying thing, or raise your hands, or speak in tongues, or do certain things. And lastly, the fourth thing that this well survival was found upon is pledge your word, and you will fully obey, that you will fully obey the Holy Spirit. Because it's a journey. When you walk out of this place this morning, you've got the opportunity to do what you want to do. Do what you want to do with the word. But I know the Holy Spirit is on a journey with you. He will not leave you there. He will ask you. We will guide you. We will teach you. And we've got the option whether we're going to cooperate or not. You're reaching. You're going beyond my control. That's why man, God has never intended it for man to control other men. It's not biblical. I'm giving over to the Holy Spirit. And in, in many ways, the Holy Spirit is busy with you right now. You know where you are right now. You know about decisions that you need to make. I want to close your eyes just wherever you are. And the Holy Spirit has been pressing upon you this morning. Upon the decision that you need to make. Maybe you sit here this morning and you do not know Christ as your Lord and Savior. I want to pray for you this morning. If that's you, that's not in a relationship with Christ, that says, Lord Jesus, here I am this day. I'm choosing you. This day I'm choosing life. This day I choose to surrender to you. I want to give you that opportunity. Don't you want to raise your hand wherever you are? And just say, Yaku, I need that prayer. I need to surrender to Christ this morning. Thank you, Jesus. I've got one more prayer that I want to pray. I assume then every one of us are in relationship with Christ this morning, and that's fine. At one o'clock this morning, I couldn't sleep, and the Lord woke me up and started speaking to me. He said, ask the people this, would you allow me, listen to this, would you allow me 
to set your heart on fire. Sometimes we think we're okay until, he, until we allow him to take us further down the road and then when we look back, we realize we were not actually so okay. It's only because from where we stand now, from where we perceive now, what we see, we think is okay. Until God really sets your heart on fire, or set your heart on fire until he really stirs something in your heart that you realize, wow, did I drift that much. And I believe that God is about to do certain things in us as a congregation, to stir up certain things, to make us fall in love with Him again, to bring us back to that place of first love, to say, Lord Jesus, it's all about you. I have time. I have time. Because you're important to me. I'm going to ask you, if you sit here this morning, I want to pray for you, just wherever you are. Don't have to come to the front. That God will baptize you with His fire. That that fire will burn away every form of religion, every form of mechanical type of prayer, every form of anything that prohibits you from experiencing the fullness. Anything that came in along the way, maybe you started serving the Lord wholeheartedly, passionately, faithfully, but somewhere you just drifted. You still, and I'm, I, I want to emphasize that, you're still a child of God, but you're just not in love anymore. If that's you that's saying, Lord Jesus, set my heart on fire again for you. I'm going to give control over to the Holy Spirit because I can't do that. I want you to stand just where you are because I believe God is going to set so many people on fire again just to go out there and say, Lord Jesus, here I am. Set things in motion. Start this new way. Walking with me, Lord Jesus. Take me in a new direction. Set me up, Lord Jesus. Even if that, I don't want to say bad news, but Lord Jesus, bring me to those places so that you can set me up.